It is December 25th, 1943. On board, at sea, we sing familiar words to familiar tunes in unfamiliar surroundings. Chaplains tell the familiar story, the miracle of Christmas. But to us, miracles seem antiquated and far away. Tomorrow, we will open a different package, the island of New Britain, hot, humid, steeped in the exotic odor of decay. Mosquitoes king-sized will swarm over us. Spiders as big as dinner plates will crawl over us. Wasps three inches long will sting us. Rivers will burst their banks trying to drown us. And trees will fall, killing 20 of us. Miracles seem for the past. Our worry is the future. But although we do not know it, intelligence has misevaluated an aerial photograph and laid the groundwork for another Christmas miracle. For the 1st Marine Division, this is our first battle since Guadalcanal. It is strangely quiet ashore, but we know they are there. They should have cut loose by this time. Must be waiting for point-blank range. They're letting us get ashore. feet into the jungle and your feet would still be in the water. So far, not a shot has been fired. No enemy encountered. We have landed with complete immunity. With his superior knowledge of the terrain, General Matsuda had placed his limited forces with considerable shrewdness. Had the Marines known as much about the area while making their plans as their new one hour after their landing, they probably would have chosen one of the beaches where they were expected. But as man projects his training, his reasoning, his background, and his experience toward ultimate effort, the 10-star general often watches over his shoulder and with positive strokes of swift certainty, covers the flaws, redraws a perfect plan. A ditch at Waterloo, the opening of the Red Sea, the bridge at Remagen. At Cape Gloucester, it was faulty intelligence. Oblique photographs taken during the pre-landing bombing strikes showed hundreds of bomb craters full of water. Since there were virtually no rim shadows, it indicated a high water table at almost ground level. Today, with hindsight, we know this. Then, we did not. And the fact that we did not know it resulted in complete tactical surprise. Some would call this misinterpretation luck. Others, fortune. Most of us recognize it as divine guidance. On the day after Christmas, the Marines landed where they were not expected. Caught General Matsuda by surprise and split his forces without the loss of a single man. This is our miracle. We hack, push, shove, crawl, anything to get through the jungle. And suddenly we find why the enemy did not expect us here. 
damp flat, our map makers designated it. Damp flat. A bog, a quagmire, a swamp, a morass, sinkhole. Damp, clear up to your chin. This is for ducks and mermaids. There is no bottom to the goo. Imagine having to move artillery and heavy equipment through 400 yards of this. A forest giant loosened by bombardment tottered, crashes, and we suffer our first marine casualty. slide through 900 yards of this. No wonder the enemy is not here to oppose our progress. He'd have to do his fighting from a canoe. Finally, one unit reaches firm footing, begins its advance toward the airfield. Enemy riflemen bar the way. general counterattack is swift, vicious, and lasts four hours. With our bazookas, we score repeated hits, and repeatedly, the projectile malfunctions. Again, nothing. The first of our daily cloud bursts arrive. There is no shelter or escape. Shoes, socks, uniforms, equipment, all are drenched and will never be fully dry until we are taken from the island many weeks hence. Now we know why the bazooka rockets do not detonate. The earth is a chocolate sponge, sucking the projectile into the mushy softness, smothering it in impotence. We need tank support. So bulldozers scrape and fill, and a road of sorts is begun. One particular bunker is giving us a bad time. Ammunition runs low, and the only vehicle able to reach us is the Amtrak. Behind us, somewhere, the road is still being gouged. We hear a snorting, a clanking, a wheezing. Someone is going to have tank support. We ready the bazooka. But it is ours. It is welcome. It is stuck. Help comes from an unexpected source. In the open, the driver exposed to enemy fire. The driver becomes a casualty. Another Marine volunteers for his job and is hit. We give the third Marine withering covering fire. And this third bears the charm. The drivers are vindicated. They have given service above and beyond. The attack moves forward. Then began the case of the disappearing enemy. He was near. Evidence of his presence was everywhere, but somehow 
Colonel Sumilia managed to withdraw his troops after each engagement. The Marines could not find his real concentration of strength. On December 28, 1943, mud and rain caved in the position of Corporal Kashida Shigeto. The good corporal had been indoctrinated to expect torture and death. Instead, he was dug out, given K-ration and a cigarette. He talked freely and indicated the presence of the 141st and 142nd regiments. This rocked General Rupertus, General Shepard, and their staffs back on their heels. One unit was not supposed to be on New Britain, and the other many miles away. If the corporal's information was correct, the enemy was capable of throwing greater strength into the counterattack that had been anticipated. Patrols scout Razorback Ridge. Wherever he is, he has done a good job of hiding. Today, he is nowhere. Tomorrow, he is everywhere, fighting. Five hours later, he withdraws and again disappears. Where was the main body of troops? With their limited knowledge of the terrain, the Marines sent units to block any retreat. They reported no sign of withdrawal. He was still somewhere within the area. The first clue came in the form of a message sent by Japanese Lieutenant Abe. It read, it is essential that we conceal the fact that we are maintaining positions on Aogiri Ridge. Here at last was a probable location of enemy strength. But where was Aogiri Ridge? Our own map showed two main elevations, Hill 660 and the smaller hill 150. The terrain of which his attack might come and through which ours must move was a mystery. Unusual situations demand unusual tactics, and General Shepard devised one. He proposed to hold fast on the left and center of the beach perimeter, while the right of the line redeployed and attacked generally to the southeast on a front of a thousand yards. As the movement was begun, reaction was immediate. For two days, we fight an enemy we cannot see. Artillery, mortar shells, and air bombs are almost useless. They cannot penetrate the dense forest overhead. We need tanks to spearhead us across Suicide Creek. Again, the bulldozers build a road for the tanks. But the creek banks are too steep and have to be caved in by the dozers. Again, drivers become casualties. And again, the job is finished. The first takes the plunge. But again, the enemy withdrew. And again, we knew that Aogiri Ridge had not been found. As our lines moved forward, Hill 150 became the next suspect of Japanese strength. The 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, moved against it and secured it after surprisingly weak resistance. The invisible enemy and the location of Aogiri Ridge began to haunt the Marines. Most deductions placed it from 1,000 to 2,000 yards southwest of Hill 150. They are wrong. We sense we have found it but we cannot explain the reason. The ground seems level, yet it rises as we progress. We push on. Then, for two days, we do not advance. Efforts to flank the position fail, so the dozers build another causeway for the tank. One battalion loses two commanding officers within five hours. The third is destined for hand-to-hand -hand fighting and will leave his name to mark this stubborn, violent, invisible corner of Hades where we fight. 
we inch forward. One day, two days, three unending days, four nightmares, five centuries, six millenniums, seven eternities. The week's progress can be measured in feet. Attempts to encircle are stopped cold. This is Aogiri Ridge. By now, the question was not whether the Marines could advance, but whether they could hold their hard-earned gains. It was then, in the words of the division's special action report, that Colonel Walt's leadership and courage turned the tide of battle. Putting his shoulder to the wheel of a 37 millimeter gun, he began pushing, shoving. Colonel Walt pulled both arms from their shoulder sockets, but he kept shoving. And his men, his magnificent Marines, added their strength. By superhuman effort, the gun was manhandled up the steep slope and into position to sweep the ridge. The Marines and the enemy were 30 feet apart. But as the Marines occupied one end of the ridge, so did the Japanese. Colonel Walt could hear them grouping for an attack. Four times they banzai from only yards away. We hold our fire until the crucial moment. As they regroup for the fifth attack, we are dangerously low on ammunition. A battalion command post detail gets it through with less than four minutes to spare. The fifth, furious, fast-paced, final. is ended. Aogiri Ridge is ours. At 0800, on 10 January, the Marines advanced five companies abreast towards the next high ground. They soon discovered why Aogiri Ridge had been so important to the enemy. Behind it lay a wide, firm, much-used trail that did not show on our maps. It had been the chief route of supply and reinforcement for the Bogan Bay area. But it was still evident that the enemy had been able to withdraw several thousand troops. Now begins one of the war's most gigantic games of hide and seek. The enemy is retreating toward Rabaul. Somewhere in the 8,000 square mile area of western New Britain, he is fleeing. On 26 January, his main route is discovered. Ground patrols chase him to the east. Kokopo, Gorisi, Kari'ai, Iboki, Talawaga, Abmadan, Bulawatini, Ogitni. Trail juncture for the escaping units from Cape Mercus. They are ahead of us. Other units leapfrog up the coast. A few seconds after the picture of this patrol in the Natoma area was taken, a Japanese machine gun, hidden by the underbrush, opened fire, killing two and wounding several others. If the strong enemy positions on the Willamette Peninsula could be overrun, the Marines would have an excellent interception point for all retreating units in transit between Ojetni and Numundo Point. Since sea and air control were now in our hands, the move was undertaken in 38 LCMs and 17 LCVPs of the Army's 553rd Engineer Boat Battalion and five LCTs from the Navy. This was a daring and tricky maneuver. The small boats would have to cross 60 miles of open sea, maintain contact and position throughout the night, 
arriving at their objective shortly after dawn. It was born of haste and necessity. American planes were scheduled to pick up the convoy at first light. As dawn jumps over the horizon, we look for them. None comes. We stand offshore, waiting for the aerial cover, which is to protect us until we are unloaded. None comes. Later, we will learn it is not their fault. They are weathered in. But now, we are not consoled. But if the airmen of other services had forgotten us, our own had not. We look up, give a mighty cheer. Marine air cover has arrived. With complete disregard for their personal safety, Captain Theodore A. Petrus and his passion dive through heavy enemy machine gun fire and drop 30 grenades. It was an act of great personal bravery. However, the craters thus created scarcely impeded the Marines as they dashed ashore. Fortunately, opposition to the landing was light, and although stiff resistance developed as fighting progressed, the Marines overran the Willamette Peninsula. But once again, the invisible enemy retreated into invisibility. For the last time on New Britain, he disappeared. After 18 months, during which it had dominated all our planning, all our thinking, and all our fighting, Rabaul was now isolated. Rabaul was now impotent. Rabaul was now strategically unimportant. We did not pursue the retreating enemy. Possession of the Western fortune secured the right flank for the push up to the Philippines and isolated more than 90,000 enemy forces at Rabu. 90,000 Japanese who would still be there until the day of surrender. 90,000 Japanese cut off from supply or transfer to other battle areas. 90,000 men who would not fire a single shot or kill a single American. 90,000 men withering and inactivated in the backwash of the war.